what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, our guests to, uh, to speak. We have Kim Foltz of Boston Bikes who's going to tell us a little bit about the general bike strategy and the safety study that was recently done and leading into an engineering update from Katie uh, Choey Cho. Um, of uh, the specific commercial street uh, bike lanes that will uh, that, are, that are proposed to be constructed. So, over to you. Thank all you. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ward. Thank you all for having us here tonight. Um, again, my name is Kim Foltz. I'm with Boston Bikes, which is Mayor Walsh's bike program. And um, so I wanted to kick things off with um, just an overview of what Boston Bikes is about. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to just talk briefly about Boston Bikes, our goals, um, the programs that we have, um, just to give a little bit of context. Um, I'm going to pass it along then to Jessica Mortel from Tool Design Group. Um, um, they conducted a safety study that was requested by this group, and she's going to um, quickly walk through that study. Um, I know people are uh, very anxious to hear from Katie, um, my colleague Katie Cho from the Public Works Department, um, about the commercial street bike track. So we're going to try to keep our portion of the evening short so we um, can move on to um, this exciting project and make sure that we have plenty of time for discussion. So just quickly, Boston Bikes, um, our goals, we talk um, in transportation planning and bicycle planning about um, the five E's, so engineering, encouragement, education, evaluation, and enforcement. Um, Boston Bikes um, sort of undercutting all of these five goals is a commitment to equity, to ensuring that all residents have access to biking if they um, are, choose to do so or are able to do so. So um, part of our encouragement and education, um, we have a whole suite of community programs. We work in the Boston Public Schools. Um, throughout the school year, we get about seven to 8,000 kids on bikes in the schools over the course of the year. We collect and refurbish bikes and donate them to low-income residents um, in neighborhoods, literally every single neighborhood in the city. Um, we, we do a lot to really um, encourage biking and make biking accessible to residents. Um, we also do a lot of work around evaluation, so we want to make sure that, that what we're doing is effective. So part of that is conducting annual bike counts um, at locations um, all across the city. Um, we do surveys of um, cyclists, of drivers, of um, all users of the road. So this is to really inform our programs and make sure that um, we're doing, making the best use of the resources that we have. And then an awful lot of what we do is around um, public events and encouragement. Um, this is a picture from our annual Hub on Wheels bike ride. Um, it's the one day when you can ride car free on Sterling Drive. It's a bike ride off um, throughout the city. Um, fantastic event that gets several thousand people out. Um, and then um, we also manage the New Balance Hubway bike share system um, that's uh, bike share share so people have access to bikes um, parked at stations all over the greater Boston area. Um, in Boston we currently have 92 stations, soon to be uh, 108, um, expanding the system very soon. And the bike share system, Hubway, has really surpassed all expectations. Um, we're, we've um, hit our 3 million ride, we expect to hit 4 million rides. Um, sometime later this year. So it's really become an um, important piece of the transportation infrastructure in the city of Boston. And then finally, a big part of what we do um, is around bike infrastructure. So ensuring that there are safe facilities for, for people to bike on. When Boston Bikes was launched in 2007, um, we had about 100 feet of bike lane. Um, we are soon, this season, we will um, put in our 100th mile of bike lane. So over a very short period of time, we've gone from being one of the worst cities for biking to uh, being recognized nationally as one of the best. And a big part of that is um, we spent a lot of time um, over about a three-year period um, 
worked with community groups all over the city and residents from every neighborhood to put together a uh, comprehensive 30-year bike network plan. Um, and um, this was, so this looked at different kinds of facilities uh, from protected bike lanes, which we're going to hear about um, one of the most exciting ones of those very soon, um, to dedicated separated lanes that don't have any physical barrier, um, to shared lane markings, um, and some sh shared streets. Uh, so that really guides the infrastructure work that we do around um, bike lanes um, every year we work to install one. So in, I think, the fall of 2013, we presented to um, this group, to the neighborhood, um, a plan to put in um, a bike lane on North Washington Street and Cross Street. Um, and there were some concerns raised about the safety um, and the, the impact. And so um, we installed that bike lane only in paint um, rather than in thermal plastic, which is the more permanent uh, solution. And um, we conducted a safety study to um, really evaluate what was what's the impact of this lane um, and you know, is it improving safety for bikers? Is it improving safety for other users of the road? Um, tool Design Group conducted that study for us, so I'm going to pass this along to Jessica Mortel from Tool to share this study with you all. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica, as Kim just said. I've been with Tool Design Group for about five years. I'm an engineer in the Boston office, and we are a multimodal engineering planning and landscape architecture firm. We specialize in biking and walking, but we aim to make the street safer for all users, transit, and motor vehicles. So we conducted a safety study on North Washington Street, and the existing network is shown right here. You can see that we have a lot of facilities in the downtown area. Commercial Street currently has some bike facilities, and what we did, we looked at making this connection uh, over the North Washington Street Bridge, looking at North Washington Street, Cross Street, and Surface Street. Service Road, excuse me. Uh, so some of the project goals for this particular project are to improve safety, reduce conflicts, increase visibility and predictability. So when you strike that right lane, it's telling people where to ride on the street, where motor vehicles can predict bicyclists to be. It encourages lower speeds. So when you strike that travel lane, it visually narrows the street and helps to encourage lower speeds. And we're looking really to increase the connectivity from Charlestown to downtown and to the West End. So what we have on the street, these markings show we have bike lanes, shared lane markings, and we have two bike boxes that helps bicyclists get in front of the queue to make them more visible. And just for those of you who don't necessarily bike, I want to go through what these facilities mean. So shared lane markings are these markings on the road that indicate the best place for bicyclists to ride. Um, it increases visibility to motorists and alerts them of where bicyclists may be. Um, it directs bicyclists where to ride. Bike lanes, I'm sure you've seen all these all over the city and commercial street. It separates, it provides a dedicated space for bicyclists through pavement markings and purchase lower speeds, as I mentioned. And it also helps encourage people to ride on the street rather than on the sidewalk. So bike boxes, um, they're the green pavement parking, so you may see them on, uh, on the greenway. Uh, they provide a designated space at inter signalized intersections and allow bicyclists to get in front of the queue. So this project went from Atlantic Ave to North Washington Street on cross and surface streets. Uh, there are shared lane markings, bike lanes, and bike boxes, as we mentioned. Uh, no parking was removed as part of this project, and we did not remove any travel lanes. The way we installed these facilities was just to narrow the travel lanes to accepted minimums. Same with uh, North Washington Street, where the street comes together. Uh, there's no bike boxes on this portion, but again, no parking removal and no travel lane removal. So as a part of the safety study, we did before and after. Uh, data collection at six key locations based on commuting patterns. We did the southbound into town in the morning uh, at three key locations where the cross sections change. And then again in the afternoon, we did three key locations based on the commute. Uh, we did both studies before and after during sunny weather conditions to make sure that the study was similar conditions. So what we looked at, we tried to get a wide cross section 
of all users. Um, we looked at bicyclist positions, vehicle positions, interactions between all the different modes, including pedestrians. I heard a lot of um, concern about bicyclists not yielding to pedestrians, so we looked at that as a part of the study, especially running red lights. We looked at illegal behaviors by motorists. It's really about people. So whether you're on a bike, walking, driving, taking transit, making sure that people are really following the rules of the road. We also looked at speeds, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So vehicle positions, the way we did this, we looked at five feet from a parked car. That's typically the width of a bike lane. We measured where the vehicle was traveling in relation to parked cars. So outside five feet was considered outside the bike lane in the before condition. Inside of five feet was considered in the bike lane. So as you can see here, the after conditions, we had 89% of people driving outside of the bike lane, which increased. So that was a great um, point of the study. For the bus and truck, this was also something we heard about as a concern, the interactions between bicyclists and buses. So we looked at this, um, you can see the total before, 60% of people were driving outside five feet from the bike lane, and then afterwards, 49% of uh, bus drivers were driving outside the bike lane, so there was a decrease in that. But you can also see the numbers, there was a lot more volume of bus drivers. And later in the presentation, I'll talk about what we observed when bicyclists were present. So all of those buses weren't always passing a bicyclist, so we didn't always see a conflict when there was a bus or a truck there. When the bicyclist was present, they typically rode outside of the bike lane. So some statistics on what we captured from in terms of ridership. We had a 27% increase in ridership. And when there are more bicyclists on the road, there's safety in numbers. The cultural shift of people seeing bikes, expecting them there, there's proven safety in numbers. We saw a 46% decrease in sidewalk riding, which is great for the pedestrians. No, and no, no, no. That's what we saw, but you guys live here, so we want to hear your comments, and we can continue to study. So, thank you for your comments. Um, an 18% decrease in riding in the door zone. Does anyone know what the door zone means? So you're riding outside of the swing of the door. So that's good also. So that way, when you're biking, you don't get nailed by a car door. Um, and then we, the, the two, roadway riding stayed the same in the before and after installation. At intersections, we did some uh, observations of how people uh, behave at lights. So we looked at bicyclist behaviors. The percent change was uh, based on the before and after the volumes were different. So we saw an 8% increase in people waiting and stopping at the green lights, which is good. Um, we saw some people stopping and then going on the red lights. Um, we saw a negative increase in that, so 10% of people decrease in doing that, and then 3% of the people were running red lights. You say people, people, are they bicyclists. pedestrians or bicyclists? I'm sorry. They say so. Okay, people. thank you, thank you. So the numbers and the last <coughs> columns are raw numbers, right? They're not, no percentage. The left columns are raw numbers. Yeah. There's a percentage at the bottom, percentage running red lights. Yeah. From 21% to 24%. I'm not, I'm not getting that. This so the total the number of bicyclists, yeah. so summing all of that, it was 20% of people in the four condition, four conditions, and then afterwards, the total amount of people was 24%. Bicycle bikes. Bicycle bikes. Yeah. It's people on bikes. Yes. People on bikes. Percentage of bicyclists. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it, the way I'm reading it, percentage of running red lights before was lower than after, meaning that more people are running red lights. Is that the correct it reading is of that? Statistically correct that way, but there were more people riding bikes afterwards. No, that's good. That, that, that's the good part of it. But it, just one comment on that, and I'll let you go. But um, it just those first of all, those numbers seem awfully low. I don't know of any people who stop at, at red lights. Honestly. Oh well, good for you. Awesome. Good for you. Um, but um, but but um, just I, I'm not sure which. If you were measuring at at the North Washington and Causeway Street intersection, maybe I can believe that. Mm -hmm. But if you're measuring at other intersections, you know the the um, the intersection which uh, I can't remember the Thatcher Street. Yeah. Uh, you know I I wouldn't take anyone to stop. So. 
we have all the road data, and I can show it to you, and this changes daily. You're out here two days a year, so you guys live here. We rely on you, and as a part of the Boston Bikes program, enforcement is going to be a key strategy as well as education. So those are things we're definitely considering, so thank you. Um, also for vehicular behaviors, we did see some illegal behaviors. Some people were running red lights, not many. Um, two and three, so people in cars were running red lights. Um, we saw some illegal turning movements. Uh, it decreased by 12% after the bike lanes were installed, so that was great. Uh, we did see some illegal U-turns by motorists that increased afterwards. We did a speed study. It was in-person data, data collectors for all of this, so there is some human error. We used a radar gun. The before studies were 30 miles per hour in both the northbound and the southbound direction. The after uh, study showed that it was 30 miles per hour in the northbound and 31 miles per hour in the southbound direction. At what time today? So other observations from our data collectors in the field, we did not observe any near conflicts between bicyclists and buses and heavy vehicles, so trucks. Uh, buses and heavy vehicles did not ride in the bike lane when bikes were present. So if someone was riding in the bike lane, they were not on the, or inside of the bike lane. Um, bicyclists and buses typically yielded to each other, so that was good. So buses accessing the bus lane and exiting yielded to bikes in most uh, situations. And there were some conflicts observed with people, ac motorists accessing the parking lane. So we did observe some conflicts between that. And between that and bikes? Yes. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Yeah, I want to hear you uh, say something about how bicyclists interact with pedestrians. My name is Monica School and I live on Commercial Street, which actually has two bike lanes, one in each direction. That doesn't keep people from riding on the sidewalk. And if I see a single guy or a single girl, I can tell them, you know, how, you know use the uh, bike path. But then I have seen families, and those are mainly, I guess, tourists. They, you know, pick up the hub, uh, bikes, and they think that they're safe on the side. And if you know the way that you're going to have the bike path going, the way that you're going to do it, will there be a barrier between the uh, the uh, sidewalk and the bike path. Are you talking about Commercial Street? Yes, or, or any street, but Commercial okay. Street is my first, uh, because, I mean, it's ridiculous now if you walk down Commercial Street that people use the sidewalk. I mean, this is a place where you actually spend a lot of money, took a lot of uh, parking places to make it accessible, and it almost seems like that there are more people using the sidewalk than using the bike paths. And the second thing is too the I should say you know the professional I mean the guys who really do use the the bike paths they don't stop for a red light so I mean what are we going to do? I can speak. So my name is Katie Cho. I'm the chief engineer for the Public Works Department. I'm in charge of all of the roadway and sidewalk construction in the city, and so I'm running the Connect Historic Boston project. I do have a project manager who's working for me who's in charge of the day-to-day, -day, which is on vacation this week, so I got to come to meet you all. Um, so I can speak to the design of the commercial street cycle tracks that we're putting in, and, and hopefully this will meet some of your concerns. Um, so what we're putting in on commercial street is a cycle track that's at the same level as the sidewalk, but, but there's a, a buffer between the sidewalk where the pedestrians are walking and where the cyclists are going to be. There's physical barriers between the two of them. So things like the street light poles will be there. There will that's where the hybrids will be. There's an actual, there's a difference in pavement materials and textures there, so that the bicyclists should not be they're not going to want to or be able to in most cases cross over into where the pedestrians are. So it should keep them physically separated. Um, the reason why people are right in general, the reason why people ride on the sidewalks rather than on the street is because they don't feel safe on the street. So the idea of giving them a protected, um, a protected place that's off the street and away from the vehicles where the vehicles cannot go should increase people actually biking where you want them to be, which is away from the pedestrians. Okay. 
So that's the way that this uh, section works. Between the sidewalk and the parked truck? Between, yes, it will be between the sidewalk and the parked cars. Exactly, with a curb, it's raised up six inches. So. And just to add on to that, um, other cities across the country have put in protected bike lanes. Um, New York City has done a whole lot of them, um, for example. And um, across the board, the sidewalk riding after protected bike lanes are put in goes down dramatically because there is a safe facility, a place where people feel safe riding in the roadway where it's physically impossible for cars to get in there unless they do like this driver did and hit the Mercedes fence, you know, unless it's an absurd um, scenario. So um, the commercial street project that Katie is going to talk about um, is, will have a much more dramatic impact than the bike lane um, that, you know, we've already seen the striping on the North Washington Street site did, that we saw before and after change in sidewalk riding uh, decrease. Um, we understand, we hear you that there are people riding on the sidewalk and we want to make that decrease keep on happening. Uh, if people have other questions about uh, the commercial street project and the cycle track, I know Kay's going to talk specifically about that. Um, are there specific questions on the North Washington Street? I see several hands, yeah. So a question about, uh, you mentioned the bike share program, and a lot of the people that seem to be riding on the sidewalks here, at least to our tourists, is there any wording on the bikes themselves that tell them that the law states that you can't ride on the sidewalks? Um, that's a great question. There is, yes. Um, yeah, when you sign up. Um, at, at the point of sign up, I, this, this, um, and it says don't ride on the bike on the sidewalk. Yeah. Where? The, the sidewalk riding law is a little um, tricky, a little loose, yes. Uh, it says there's no sidewalk riding in um, commercial districts. Commercial districts or business districts aren't defined anywhere. Um, I can tell you we work with the Boston Police Department on enforcement. We just had um, um, some sergeants out um, on Commonwealth Avenue um, in Alston and then going into Brighton um, for a couple days last week and they were stopping people riding on the sidewalk and um, encouraging them or you know urging them to bike in the roadway. Um, they were stopping them for running red lights and things like that. Um, so it's something that we do do. Um, we know that there are um, cyclists who run red lights, who ride on the sidewalk, and we want to discourage that behavior. We want to change that behavior. Yes. I don't know if it's a silly question, but if the police officer sees someone, a bicyclist running a red light, can they give them a ticket? I mean, what do they do? Uh, they can give them a ticket uh, because bikes, bikes riding in the roadway have to follow the same laws, um, you know, the same traffic laws. But how do they do a ticket license? Uh, yeah, they, they get their ID. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I was on Boylston Beacon Street last week. People were getting their bikes from the Hubway thing riding the sidewalks. Yes. People were running to get out of their way. They had no helmets. They had nothing. I don't understand how they can ride the bikes without a helmet and why they're on the sidewalks. Yes. So again, we're doing um, a lot, especially with the, the kinds of um, facilities that can protect it by planes to um, encourage and provide safe facilities so that people will bike on the streets rather than the sidewalks, and we know that these facilities help. Um, helmets, um, it's not the law in Massachusetts or in Boston that people have to wear helmets. We certainly, our Boston Bikes um, encourages it. We run a subsidized membership program in the Hubway um, bike share system, and every single member who signs up as a subsidized member gets a helmet in the mail. Um, we also have low-cost um, retail 
facilities all across the city where people can purchase um, a low-cost helmet, whether or not you're a subsidized member of the Hubway Bike Share System. Uh, the officers that were out doing the enforcement um, on Commonwealth Avenue um, were giving out free helmets, um, and we do events like that with the police, not with the police, um, to encourage helmet use. So um, we're definitely concerned about safety. We want to increase safety. We also, we piloted the first um, helmet vending machine in the country as part of the, um, our bike share system. Um, it's called Helmet Hub. Uh, the startup company that developed that technology um, has had a few bumps in the road, but we hope to be able to roll some of those machines out if they um, are able to, to provide them. Um, so, we share your concern about people you know, riding on the sidewalk and um, wearing, a, wearing helmets. May I make a comment, please? I walk. I don't ride a bike. I walk everywhere in the city. I walk on cracked sidewalks. I walk on curbstones 18 inches high, try to get up on the sidewalk. I walk across the street on the crosswalk. They all need to be painted. Crosswalks, bikes come, don't stop the whole nine yards. You're spending all this money for bikes. What are you doing for me who walks and isn't got the pr proper equipment to walk on? Okay, so I think Katie can answer that. Okay. I can speak to that. So uh, I fully understand the concern. I was an exclusive, almost an exclusive pedestrian up until about three months ago when I learned to ride a bike. So I, I was very much a pedestrian. Um, and the sidewalk program falls under my purview, so I, I have a deep, deep understanding of the poor condition of most of the sidewalks in the city. We invest approximately $10 million a year in improving sidewalks, and that does not include the crosswalk programs that we have and that sort of thing. The problem is we have $450 million worth of sidewalk work that we have to do throughout the city. We have 1,600 miles of sidewalks, so it's a very, very difficult program to manage. Um, I would encourage you to advocate with your city councilors to increase my budget because I would love nothing more than to spend more money on sidewalks because we need it. So. Take money away from the bikes that they don't pay attention to the streets. <laughs> my budget I mean, is actually much seriously. higher than budget. Yeah. So. I mean, it's like rewarding the bad. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, that's exactly what it is. I read that this cost you $35 million. Which? This, uh, Connected to our Boston. Connected to our Boston is... Program we have here. Um, I don't know yeah. what your bike budget is. Including the federal money. So for the Connected to our Boston project, yeah. it's the construction of that project is $23 million, but that is not, that's not bike, that's, a, the bike piece is a very, very small piece of that. We're fully reconstructing all the roads and all the sidewalks associated with that. So the bulk of that money is actually not associated with the bike piece of it. The bulk of it is actually associated with the sidewalks and the roadways. So the one other thing to um, respond to uh, the comment about sidewalks and pedestrians, uh, Mayor Walsh announced in March that uh, Boston has um, joined the Vision Zero initiative. If you don't know what Vision Zero it is, um, it's a commitment to eliminate traffic fatalities um, for all users of the road, but particularly vulnerable users, pedestrians, and cyclists. Um, as part of the Vision Zero task force, um, I sit on that task force, uh, we've been conducting um, an analysis of, um, of pedestrian um, crashes where, where vehicles have hit pedestrians. Um, we did the same thing for cyclists, and we actually looked at um, biker, bike, and pedestrian conflicts as part of that that analysis. Um, so we are identifying um, hot spots around the city. The goal is to um, identify the 10 to 15 um, most common points of um, vehicle pedestrian um, conflicts, crashes, and um, look at what kinds of um, design solutions we can do, um, are there things that we can do with the traffic signals, um, how to improve those hot spots. And in some cases, it might be looking at a corridor. Um, we're finding a lot of the hot spots, for example, are along Massachusetts Avenue. Um, but you know, in some cases, it's a, a particular intersection. So um, that is increasingly a, a priority of the administration and the Boston Transportation Department. Um, 
The other thing is um, our department, Boston Bikes, um, the, you all uh, remember Nicole Friedman, who was the director of our program. She presented this North Washington Street project, I think, to you or to this group. Um, she's left from the city. The, the city's taking um, a broader look at that position, and it's now going to be an active transportation director. So that's incorporating both walking and biking into how we think about um, the, the streets. So um, we really are, um, you know, ensuring that pedestrians um, who are major users of the road and major ways for lots of people to get around that um, we're allocating more resources. There. Uh, you skimmed the cross, cross street, but I haven't heard any details on cross street, which is a horror show with cars. I don't know if you have any intention of sticking bikes on that street. I know you're going to be looking for a lot of trouble if you do. You talked about cross street, but you skimmed right over it and never said anything about it. So, so cross street is a part of the study that we did. So. You could look, we have some of the maps. When you put the maps up, it would be easier to understand if they go by two facts. Again, I want to make sure that, so I don't know how much more time we have. I want to make sure, because I know there are things, commercial street is a big project, and um, I want to make sure we give due time to Katie in that case. So North Washington Street is where Cross Street and Purchase Road come together. So Cross Street is on the southern portion of this map. You can see this blue line that curves around the north end is Commercial Street. We did three different locations for the morning and three different locations in the afternoon for the before and after conditions of this study. Uh, Cross Street in the southern portion, we studied location four at Hanover Street. That was the main location um, for Cross Street in this study. Do you have a specific question on Cross Street? Yeah, starting from uh, Atlantic Ave mm -hmm. right up through which is the bottleneck of the world. And uh, you can't get cars up there, let alone get a bike through there. I'm more concerned what cross street from Atlantic Ave to uh, beyond Hanover State to Endicott Street. So we did not change the cross section of the street. We narrowed the travel lanes. So at that location, we actually, at Valenti Way, where it meets up, and then no, there's no, that bottleneck. No, no, no. That's too far about? down. Too far I'm talking from, from coming out of South Station, by the park, by the park, up through that narrow pathway that just about fits a bus and a car. And uh, you, I don't know if you have an intention of putting a bike lane there, but you're out of your mind if you do, because people are going to get killed there. Yeah, it, um, it went in, so it, um, with the feedback from the neighborhood, we heard those kinds of concerns. Um, we put it in in paint. So it's been there since, um, I believe, October or the fall of 2013. Um, but only in paint because that's a less permanent um, application. Um, and then once the bike lane went in, in paint, uh, then we conducted the study to be able to see what its impact was. Um, we now, uh, based on the study where we saw, for the most part, the positive behavior increase and the negative behavior decrease, we're going to put this in in thermal class so that it stays. Um, and because right now the conditions are getting pretty dangerous out there. It's, there's a lot of parts where that paint has faded away. The um, cyclists who are there, they, they have a bike lane and then it kind of disappears. It's really difficult if you're a driver, you can't really see that line anymore. So the positive impacts that we saw um, in this study are starting to go away because the, it, it's harder. You're to telling me you saw in. positive impacts on Cross Street? Yes. Positive impacts on Cross Street. Did you ever walk that with the traffic? I have. I walk it. Uh, um, you're not I'll walking walk. the right place, then you're I going on the other end. I'm there every day. I see it every day. I live right down the street. I mean, putting a bike lane in there is ridiculous. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm letting you have a snap up. I want to jump up for a second and say a couple of things. Um, the traffic that we have, I'm sure you guys are aware that the BRA has, I think, and David, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think they're close to, if they haven't given s sort of some procedural go-ahead to go to the next stage for this Haymarket uh, complex. The, uh, 
the Haymarket the Garage, Government Center Garage, I think it's called. Oh, oh the Haymarket oh, Garage. Garage. Oh. Complex. I mean, it, that, that's years and years uh, away. Well, good. Because one of the things that these guys are doing, and I think it's instructive as you do these studies, is they're taking a busway. Everyone knows the Haymarket busway. It's tucked into that, and it's very, um, it's very indented into the building. And um, the developers and their wisdom, and the BRA and its wisdom, letting this pass, is pushing three bus berths right onto the curbside. Um, and claiming that they're improving the busway, which is, uh, which, which is uh, you know, a, a, a stretch uh, for the word improve. But it would seem to me that if you start pushing buses here into the street, and also Parcel 9, which is a project we've discussed in, in this group several times, um, there are tourist buses that typically line up here, and there's going to be an active hotel. You might have more activity. So what, what the question is, what are you guys going to do to try to moderate the movements of developers to try to push stuff into your bus lanes? Because I think that's a huge threat, particularly on a, a corridor like this. Great. Yeah. So um, every development needs to go through the Public Improvement Commission, which is run out of Public Works, which is a review of all of these projects. And on the Public Improvement Commission sits people from Public Works as well as people from uh, the Transportation Department. So um, all of the considerations in terms of how traffic and bikes and pedestrians move and how safe it is and how that all works is all flushed through that commission. And so that's where those sorts of discussions happen to make sure the developers are taking the proper accommodations for all three or all of the modes, transit, vehicles, pedestrians, and bicycles, all into account as they are um, proposing any development or change in curbs or curb uses or sidewalk uses. It, but a lot of stuff has to go through. Do you know if the GC garage project has gone through that process? Did they allow this pushing of the road bus? I do not think that the government center garage is to the point of having gotten to the other. Well, I hope you give them, okay. give yeah. them some feedback. So I'd say a hand over here and then one here. <laughs> yeah, I have a request uh, uh, addressed to the public safety issue. A request that was made of your predecessor, and I will tell you the answer that was given. And the request starts with an observation that there is a large panel at the uh, bikeway rental uh, uh, sections, whatever you call it, um, which has advertising. And I suggested that it would be, uh, it would enhance public safety instead of advertising uh, T-Mobile uh, phones, that the rules and regulations, or at least best practices for cyclists should be right there in front of them when they rent their, their bicycles. The answer given was, well, the advertising space is under contract. So now I ask, has the contract expired, and doesn't it make sense to put that right in front of the face of persons who rent bikes? Uh, do not ride on sidewalks. Yes. Observe traffic lights. And even if some of the uh, uh, legalities, as you suggested, are not clear, I would think that rules and regulations could be uh, adopted at least to guide the cyclists uh, to their own safety as well as that of pedestrians. So uh, I can confirm that it, it is the advertising panels um, where you see T-Mobile or Ben and Jerry's or whatever it is advertised. That is um, a long-term contract. I believe it runs for at least another three years. Um, it's a long-term contract. Um, there is some space that's dedicated not on the advertising panel but on the other side. There's a map panel. There's instructions about how to use the bikes. Um, right at the um, uh, station itself, the dock itself, where you stick in, you put in your key and you get the bike out, there's a few um, things right there that say, uh, and I wish I could remember specifically what they say, but they talk about safe riding behavior. Uh, so some of what you're suggesting is there. Um, at literally, it's pretty hard to miss as you're because you slide in your key at the dock. I don't know if any of you have used the hubway, um, and it's right there in front of you. Um, the other thing I should say that I didn't mention before is um, everybody who signs up for the hubway um, 
watches a safety video or at least has to check off that they've watched the safety video right there on the website um, to get your membership. I can ensure that all of the subsidized members who come into my office to sign up, I don't let them walk out if they haven't watched that video. Um, so we can we can always do more. Um, I'm looking at is if there's a possibility of adding additional advertising space and if we're able to do that I can see if there's a way that you know um, allocate some additional space to safety um, tips on the road and the kind of thing. Well I would hope that they would be in large letters that one could not overlook. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, not, I not tucked away. Um, over here. Um, some observations and a question as well. Um, uh, I would echo my, my neighbor's concerns about uh, illegal wiping activity on the cross street in particular. And uh, I think uh, now I'm a, uh, a pedestrian and a bicyclist. I use the area a lot. And my observation is uh, a lot of uh, subway users and other bicyclists um, tend to uh, ride on the sidewalks where it's wide, safer than riding on the street where you can't see the bike lanes or where um, there is illegal traffic activity that prevents them from using the bike lanes. I don't know if the safety study on Washington Street went as far down south as Faneuil Hall. Um, because um, I think a lot of the reason why a lot of people cut through sidewalks in the North End is because the uh, buses, the tour buses that park south of Haymarket on either side of Faneuil Hall are constantly blocking off the bike lanes, the southbound bike lanes on, on those streets literally forcing bicyclists onto the greenway and onto the sidewalks and like that. Um, so I, I don't know what steps um, your safety study is suggesting about enforcement of yeah. illegal um, parking and driving on, on that particular stretch, but it's, it's a real problem. Yeah, um, agree. And um, again, we work with the police on enforcement both for cyclists and also for drivers. Um, the, the tour buses in particular, I, um, I've mm -hmm. had some discussions within the transportation department about the tour buses, not just the impact on cyclists, but if they're there idling a lot of times, which is illegal. Um, yeah, there's lots of reasons that <coughs> we don't want those tour buses there. Right. Well, um, when, when it's particularly busy uh, with tour bus season and um, the reserve spaces on the sidewalk for tour buses are full, uh, Subsequent tour buses see the bike lanes as an alternative place to, to double park and park illegal. Right, and then that creates very unsafe conditions for cyclists. That's right. Let's have one more question because I know uh, the uh, excited update that Katie's going to give us is something that we're all waiting for. I see um, someone back here who I haven't heard from yet. Well, I, I have to say I applaud what you're doing, and I know it's, it's, it's difficult, but I think it will get much better. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, um, and I do bike and walk and drive, but I think I would probably drive a lot less if it was easier to ride. But um, are you, do you have any plans for the Washington, uh, the North Washington Bridge? Because that's really dangerous for bikes um, to get over that, and they uh, I should have mentioned before uh, the in my brief introduction um, I mentioned our 30 year bike network plan we have copies of that and there's also a five year action plan um, I know in the 30 year plan we do have um, plans for um, actually is it the five year uh, the five year action plan um, for um, protected facilities across the bridge. Um, the five-year action plan um, you know, is in part dependent on sufficient resources to accomplish it, and the, the protected facilities are harder. Um, yeah, it, and there, there are plans to replace the North Washington Street Bridge. Has that been yes. Yes. And I do believe that bike accommodations are part of that project. So. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Um, find me on Boston Bikes. Bostonbikes.org is our website. Um, this is my email address, but you can find all of my contact information on our website as well for um, for how to get in touch with me. Um, thank you all. I appreciate you.
you are having us here today. Thank you very much.